So Taylor, do you want to kick things off and kind of introduce? Yes. Yeah, let's do it. Um, I will say for those of you listening in, um, might be good to have like your phone notes open or a pen and paper um, just to jot things down as they sort of hit you while I'm talking. Um, I made this presentation uh, in hopes to really help aspiring portrait photographers um, and even portrait photographers who've been doing this for a while. Um, I hope that there's something new in here for you as well. Um, and I know sometimes inspiration or knowledge or whatever can kind of hit like a lightning bolt. So just have something ready to, to basically take your own personal notes as, as I go. Yeah, we'll be talking about kind of my um, tried and true uh, techniques and best practices for uh, getting interesting and powerful portraiture. Um, I've been doing this for a long time and I'm, I'm just now uh, starting to settle in to some of these things and I'm excited to share them with you. Um, a quick breakdown of what we're going to talk about. I, I wanted to start off by giving kind of a briefish history of me and um, kind of my journey as a photographer. Um, and then we'll get into the meat of things and talk about actually directing a portrait shoot um, and things you can do to uh, get some really nice emotion and reaction uh, out of whoever you're photographing. Um, and then we have the lovely opportunity to do a Q&A. Um, so any questions you ask throughout this in the chat, um, I will have the opportunity to answer those um, at the end, which is very exciting. So anything you might have a question about, please uh, submit those in the chat. Um, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll be done and wrap it up. I really wanted to kick things off by spending some time to talk about how I got where I'm at today, especially for those of you who are maybe not familiar with me or my work. Um, so I'm basically just going to catch you up on the last 10 years of my creative life. Um, and I hope that that will give you context for how I've come to use the techniques I do and use the practices I do. Uh, this will be especially helpful to hear if you yourself are an aspiring photographer. Um, I'm assuming there are quite a few of you in the room. Um, so I really, I really do think that hearing other photographers' stories can really take the pressure off um, because it just proves that there isn't one way of becoming a photographer. There's not one way of being a photographer. It really looks different for everybody. Um, and so I hope, I hope you can see that um, as I show you kind of the ebb and flow of my years uh, as a photographer. I truly fell in love with photography in high school, even though I had been taking a lot of photos prior to that. Uh, it really became a passion for me in those years. Um, but it was not until I was a semester away from getting a bachelor's degree uh, that I realized it was going to be my career. Like it truly could be the thing that I did. Um, you know, for not only just to stay alive and make money, um, but it, it would be something that I would pursue on a personal level too for years and years and years. Um, and so what does a girl do but drop out um, three months away from getting her college degree? Um, and I pursued photography full time right from that day. Um, it was one of those really giant leaps uh, in the grand scheme of things, when I look back, that was the first giant leap of faith. Um, but there was something inside of me that just knew a net would appear to catch me. I just, I knew it was going to work somehow. Um, I didn't know how, but I knew it would. So I had the advantage at the time, um, of living in Utah, which is like the wedding capital of I don't know, the world. <laughs> um, there are like a million weddings a day in Utah. Um, don't get me wrong. Uh, this was not my end goal. I was not like looking to be a wedding photographer for my whole life. Um, it was not like my dream by any means. 
but I knew that it would be a steady paycheck. Um, and it would also give me the opportunity to practice and therefore learn and experiment and mess up. Um, and in essence, just really grow as an image maker. Um, because of all the hours that I was hands on, um, these were the years that I really started to understand the machine that is a camera. Uh, prior to these years, I was just guessing and hoping and crossing my fingers uh, that my settings were somewhere in range. Um, I didn't really know what any of them meant, uh, what they each did on their own, how they worked together. Um, but it, it was here in these years where I was shooting, you know, almost every single day that I started to really kind of dial in my technical skills. Um, but aside from the technical side of things, um, I was also suddenly thrown into a position where I needed to direct people. Um, human beings were suddenly my main subject. Um, and the types of people I was photographing, they were all so different from each other. Um, so you're not just dealing with people, you're dealing with every sort of personality. Um, and, you know, a lot of these people were noticeably uncomfortable in front of the camera. Um, and so I had to really quickly and really creatively figure out how to give my couples directions to lead them in a direction I wanted them to go in a way that was like natural and fun. Um, and that proved to be difficult for a little bit. But then when I started to figure it out, things really started to change. Um, and this all, we'll get into all of this uh, in detail later. So after shooting weddings and couples for about three years, um, I was ready for the next chapter. Um, change was happening all around in my life, and I found it important that a creative shift happened as well. Um, I find that that happens, like my creative life and my personal life uh, are very kind of symbiotic and uh, intertwined. Um, so I took another giant leap of faith. And I actually applied for a filmmaker position uh, at a company called Moment. Um, and this position was completely out of my wheelhouse. Um, I did not have the skills for it, but I had the drive and I was really hungry to learn video. I just wanted, I wanted a new skill to master. And I was amazingly enough hired. Um, and so this is me with uh, some of my team in 2018 when I packed up and moved to Seattle to start this new endeavor. So thus began my video career. Um, I had to learn everything from the ground up about uh, making, making videos. I'd never done that. Um, I also was having to learn about YouTube because part of my job was making YouTube videos. So this was a whole new world for me. Um, and because Moment made uh, lenses for mobile phones, a lot of my work projects involved shooting on a phone. Um, so as I had just gotten comfortable, you know, operating my DSLR very confidently, um, I was sort of going back to the basics in a lot of ways, uh, having to shoot on a phone. Um, and it's really amazing what switching out your gear can do to your entire creative process. Um, and because I was shooting so much on mobile, um, it meant I was doing almost all of my editing in Visco. Um, I didn't like the flow of shooting on my phone, sending those photos to my laptop and editing them in Lightroom. It was like, it felt disconnected. Um, if I was going to shoot mobile, I wanted to edit on mobile as well. Um, and I had been obsessed with Visco uh, as a high schooler when I when I really started to get into photography. Um, but shooting so much on my phone again in, in these years really made me appreciate it all over again. Um, these gifts you're seeing are from a YouTube video I made for a moment about photo editing apps. And of course, Visco was where I did all of my main edits. So I, I had to put this in here, very nostalgic. 
love that. <laughs> <laughs> so I was shooting on my phone a lot um, for a lot of years. I captured a, a wide variety of subjects and I frequently had to really go outside my comfort zone uh, based on whatever work project I was working on. Um, and shooting so much mobile photography was both challenging and very liberating all in their own ways. Uh, but that's for another day and another presentation. <laughs> um, but having to make so much imagery um, so often for work uh, and and having that imagery be seen by a rather large audience on the internet, um, I found that was taking quite a toll on me. Um, and I reached a point of like creative burnout, life burnout, um, and possibly even just like a creative identity crisis for the first time. I've gone through plenty since then, so I'm used to them now. But this was the first time where I really got hit with like who am I as a photographer? And like, what do I want to be like aiming for? And what is the work I want to make? You know, all those big questions really started to hit. Um, I was also going through some tougher times in my personal life. And like I said, that always affects uh, my work and my creativity. Um, and it, and it did quite significantly at this time. Um, to the point that I kind of went dark. Um, I deleted all of my social media. I could not be found on the internet. I was not sharing anything. Um, I didn't even pick up a camera unless I absolutely had to. Um, and I did a lot of like learning and growing and changing in these years on a personal level. Uh, I was focusing on nurturing Taylor as a human being and I let Taylor the photographer sort of take a rest. Um, and while that was quite strange for me, it's totally okay. Um, looking back at it, I see that that's exactly what was necessary at that point in my life. Um, it was clearly a time to step back, look at life with a, li a wide lens, um, and, you know, look at my priorities and rearrange things. Um, and after, you know, months and months of like, really transformative internal deep dives, lots of solitude and silence, um, even a silent 10 day meditation retreat. Uh, you know, it, I got to a point where I really found like internal peace and I was ready to sort of bloom out of the hole that I dug for myself. Um, I was finally ready to emerge with this newfound sense of self. Um, but I didn't really know what that meant for my career or my creative work. Uh, that was definitely a scary mystery for me at this time. And I will say it's hard to give this rundown um, of my ever-changing relationship with photography and how it plays out in my everyday life without mentioning that in the midst of all of this, I had a baby. Um, and while this might seem completely irrelevant uh, to my work as a photographer, um, it's actually quite deeply tied to it. Um, my transformation into motherhood changed pretty much everything for me. Um, my abilities, my schedule, my priorities, my view of the world, my view of myself, the list truly goes on and on and on. Um, but going through something so earth rattling and yet so beautiful had me taking out my camera more and more and more. This experience was something that connected me back to the practice of shooting everyday life, um, the mundane, you know, the boring. And because of this giant paradigm shift, what felt right as far as my photography was concerned was to just slow down. Um, I had done so much of that in my personal life. It only felt right to do that in my creative life. And what a better way to slow down than to shoot film. Um, the tactical process of having to physically load the roll, having to crank each frame, um, and intentionally deciding every single time you're going to use up an exposure. All those things helped me come back to photography with excitement and a fresh perspective, which I desperately needed. 
And I began to shoot my everyday life with a point and shoot that was just in my pocket. Um, and then eventually I started to experiment with um, medium format as well. And as my creativity, you know, I started to settle back into that. I realized that what I loved most about photography was being able to capture humanity. Um, I just deeply love photographing people for whatever reason. Um, and I knew I wanted to do more of it somehow, some way. In the midst of all of this, changes were happening at work as well. Um, my coworkers and I split off from Moment and we started our own creative studio called Sunny 16. Um, and we basically operate as a production team of filmmakers and photographer. Um, we actually just signed onto a director's roster, which is incredible. Um, so we can get hired for big commercial shoots. Uh, we run multiple YouTube channels and we host a weekly podcast. So that's some of the work I'm doing now uh, with Sunny 16. Uh, this was a huge, huge shift. One of those uh, YouTube channels I mentioned is uh, one that I get to run all by myself. Um, doing that on my own seemed pretty nerve wracking when we first started um, since I was used to working as a team uh, to make videos. But I can say at about 10 months in, uh, I'm having so much fun. Uh, my channel is all about photography. So it's a very kind of perfect creative outlet for me. Uh, and it keeps my skills sharp and it keeps ideas flowing. So that kind of catches you up to where I'm at now. Um, this is where I'm at currently on this wild journey that is nowhere near being over. Um, and now after shooting for, you know, almost 10 years, seriously, I'm just beginning to really understand what work I want to make and what work I could really be great at making. Um, I've experimented a lot and practiced a lot. Um, and it also helped that I had a variety of different jobs. Um, but that all led me to kind of know what I'm good at and what I'm not good at and what I like and what I don't like and what I'm drawn to when I'm a consumer of photography. That's, that's huge information. Um, and it also helped me see kind of what I eventually want to learn and master in the future. Um, and so it's funny, I was, as I was making this presentation, it like dawned on me that photography is by far my longest relationship I've ever had. Um, and <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to really understand that the cliche of good things take time is true. Um, here I am 10 years in, and 10 years ago, I probably would have thought like, oh, I'll know exactly like I'll know exactly my lane and I'll be making exactly what I am going to make for the rest of my life in 10 years for sure. Like, of course, I'll be doing it then. But I'm here now and I'm realizing, no, this takes this takes time. Um, and it's also taken me all this time to really, truly understand that a good portrait photographer is not just dialing in. ISO aperture and shutter speed for a proper exposure. Your job as a portrait photographer goes far beyond operating the camera. And that leads us to the good stuff. We get to talk about all the lovely ways that you can make portraits quite powerful. Um, I'm so excited to tell you guys my tips and tricks, um, and I really hope they help you. Um, I cannot go into this without paying homage to my couple's photography years. These are the years where I really dialed in this technique. Um, had to find creative ways to make those hesitant participants feel comfortable enough to let loose and go with me. Um, I honestly would ask my couples, I, I, I would ask a lot of them and, and some of the things I would make them do were wild and crazy and hilarious. Um, but I knew that if I gained their trust and we really got into a flow and everyone felt free enough to go wherever it was going to go, that we would get amazing results. And so these are the years that taught me that as a photographer, I am in the driver's seat on a shoot. 
you are the one really driving the process. Um, but I realized that that didn't mean that I couldn't ask my couples to sit shotgun with me. Um, it also didn't mean we couldn't have a ton of fun. Um, and so one of the biggest learnings in those years was that where you lead as a photographer, um, whoever you're photographing will typically follow you. Um, a great work, or I'm sorry, a great change that came to my work um, happened when I started entering shoots with the mindset that my subject is really just my dance partner. That changed everything for me. Um, there's this weird power dynamic if you view it as like, you're my subject. It even sounds scary. You're my subject and I'm the photographer. There's, there's a hierarchy there. And looking at them as a dance partner takes that away and levels everything out. Um, but this perspective shift really helped because you realize when I take a step, you take a step. When I give a little, you give a little back. So when I lead, you follow. Um, and so it's really important that you give to the process what you want out of it. Um, if you want them to be open and willing to you and the process, you yourself have to be open and willing. So at a high level, that is a big message uh, to take away from this. Um, which is why I'm kind of starting out with it. Uh, I found that this drastically changed uh, my shoots and my interactions uh, on set. Okay, now I don't love explicit rules. I don't think we need like do's and don'ts, um, but here I am giving you do's and don'ts. Um, the reason I don't love that is because you are free as an artist to do whatever you want. And while there might be rules in photography, they are absolutely meant to be broken um, and played with. And, you know, it's completely up to you. The reason I do have this slide the way it is, is because even after 10 years of doing this, these are the only things I'm sure of. So it kind of goes to show. <laughs> Um, with 10 years of experience and I only have a few things I'm sure of, you know, there's a lot of room to play. Um, but if I were to give you my best advice when photographing people, um, I would advise against putting people in specific poses. Um, and I would suggest instead to give direction for some sort of action or movement. We will get into the good details about this in um, a few moments. I would also say that it's very important to not take yourself too seriously on a shoot um, and to instead look at yourself as a participant. Um, remember, this is a dance and you are half of it. Maybe even life also. Not to yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. This is actually just life advice. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, so one of one of the biggest techniques I use with people is to basically encourage the use of the imagination, both yours and theirs. Um, you can see these are actually photos of myself. Um, I actually use myself for portrait shoots when I'm just like dying to make something. Um, and so on the fly, I'll just do self portraits. Um, but it's also given me a really lovely perspective of, of my own directions because I used them on myself, um, which is quite funny. Um, this particular series uh, happened on a day where I had a studio space booked, but the model I had planned um, canceled like an hour before. And so I still had the space and I was totally in the zone that morning. I was like so ready to shoot. And so I was like, you know what? I went to a thrift store, got this cool red get up and made it a made it a thing. Um, and this particular series was taken when I gave myself uh, the direction of imagine the camera lens as an unidentified space object. So the image on the left um, 
is me sort of unsure of the thing, but sort of touching it with the back of my hand. You know, you can see that in my eyes. Like, what is this thing? I'm not so sure. In the middle, this is me sort of inviting it to come to me. And then on the right, that's me just straight up going to grab it. And you can see there's almost like a curiosity in my eyes. Um, and what I really like about using scenarios or the imagination for guiding somebody is that they might take it somewhere that you would have never thought of. Um, it leaves all this lovely room for play and experimentation and exploration. Um, so lead your dance partner and then let them go for a bit. You know what I mean? Like they might really run with something and you could get some incredible results uh, that you could have never come up with poses for. Um, and of course, using this technique, it's, it's vital um, that you've done whatever necessary to get your dance partner comfortable and willing to be imaginative with you. Um, so whether that's, you know, spending the first 10 minutes of your planned hour together chatting and truly getting to know them and, you know, your camera's not even in your hand. Um, there is definitely some work up front that is necessary to get powerful results. The next um, thing I want to talk about is using movement um, over posing. Um, by giving instructions so that your dance, I'm just going to call it your subject, your dance partner, because it's so, it sounds so much better than subject. Um, <laughs> and it's to help you remember that analogy. Um, by giving instructions so that your dance partner feels that they have the freedom to move around a bit helps keep things loose. Um, it helps keep them really open minded. Um, so let me give you an example. You could. Tell your dance partner, put your arm here, put your hand here, put your chin down, put your eyes here, pop your leg, do this, do that, and get them in this pose. But likely they're going to freeze there um, and they're going to feel like they shouldn't move. Um, and now suddenly they're like mentally trapped in this place you've put them. Um, and they might feel like there's like a right or a wrong way to be. Uh, and that is just not going to do anyone any good. Um, so instead, you can try saying something like, imagine it's really windy and you're brushing flowers off your arms and face. You know, flowers are landing on you and you're gently brushing them off. Now, suddenly, they're not so much thinking about where every, you know, finger and eyelash is. Um, and they're just imagining themselves in this fictional scene. And they're interacting with it naturally. You know, they're making the decisions and the choices. Um, this is going to get you results that are much more genuine and much more interesting than if you were to just pose them. Um, and so I would suggest if you ever try this um, to give an imaginary scene uh, that matches the emotion you're trying to get out of them. Um, so, you know, instead of saying, okay, look sad, that's really hard to do just by being told to do it. Right. So you actually want to kind of use your own imagination and spell out a scene for them that, you know, will give them the expression you want without telling them that's what you want. So here are some examples. Uh, there are a million ways to use this technique, right? Because it really depends on your personality as as yourself coming into this and what you're willing to, to do and play with. Um, and it really depends on your dance partner's willingness as well. Um, it's very important that uh, you as the photographer are comfortable uh, with what you're doing as the leader, because your comfort uh, will put your dance partner's mind at ease um, and it will make the shoot fun rather than intimidating. So these random examples uh, are things I came up with just while I was making this presentation. Um, they're actually ones I plan on using in real life uh, immediately. Um, I'm kind of constantly coming up with new prompts. Um, and these are just so that you can see um, that guiding someone in a direction 
uh, is much better than just giving away the destination. So for example, if you want a photo of somebody genuinely laughing, you could just say, okay, laugh, right? I'm sure that's happened to you before, actually. And you're going to get a laugh, but it might not be like the most genuine. Um, so there are a million alternatives to, okay, laugh, right? The one I came up with here is dance how your grandma would. And I, I do this with people I shoot. I will literally have them do the action. Be like, how does your grandma dance? And I'll make them do it. And every time, every time I do a prompt to get someone to laugh, I end up laughing. They end up laughing. We're cracking up. It's hilarious. It's like totally a moment instead of like, we're just taking photos. We're having like an actual memory happen. Um, and, you know, I'll pop my camera up for a couple frames and put it back down. Um, and that's another thing for a lot of these, my camera isn't up. Um, I'm only bringing it up when that moment is happening. Um, because otherwise I want to be eye to eye, you know, me and my dance partner are, are here. It's not the camera and them. It's me and them. Um, I never let my camera get in between us. Um, so that's another thing to think about, like how much you're bringing your camera up to your eye. Um, that really affects kind of the environment. Um, to get a different look in someone's eyes. The second example, um, this is a hard thing to achieve um, just by saying, I want your eyes to look different. <laughs> no one really knows how to change the expression in their eyes just like off the cuff like that. Um, so I came up with this line, pretend your eyelids are made of lead. Suddenly you're getting an entirely different expression from them. And they might be trying to figure it out. They might be experimenting with things and you might be getting some really amazing moments right there. Um, another example to just get a variety of expressions um, is like, tell me your most embarrassing story or, you know, tell me about the day X, Y, or Z. Uh, this technique is something I use all the time is having my dance partner tell me stories. Um, you will not get a more honest um, and, and real kind of vignette of someone, uh, than through their own storytelling. Um, it is important to make sure that there's some sort of emotive component in whatever story you're asking for. Um, you know, whether it's laughing or, you know, like a very like pensive moment, like there's so much you can get, uh, from just having your dance partner talk to you. Um, and this is another really important moment to have your camera be down. Um, this is a moment between the two of you and it's your responsibility to just capture a couple of those moments. Um, but having your camera up during the whole thing can really make things weird and um, it sort of takes away from the whole purpose of it, right? So remember kind of that it's you two first um, in this moment, in this experience, in this process, uh, and your camera is there just for the seconds that you need it to be. That is a really great, I don't, if, has anyone else heard that? Like, has anyone else heard that as a piece of advice? I think we think about that and then we forget, and I've never actually heard that before. So mm -hmm. I think really interesting I'm sorry I just had to chime in no please please chime in um it helps a lot <laughs> um yeah I, I I'm starting to realize like my camera can really get in the way of things um and there's this weird pressure when you're shooting like I need to be shooting every second and it's just not the truth um it's actually all those moments that you're not shooting that are doing the work for you so having your camera down for half the time is very much okay. Um, and it will actually probably pay off. So definitely something to think about. A tip for getting striking eyes in a portrait, of course, while shooting people, um, the eyes are the window to the soul, right? Um, so they're very important. Um, and there's a lot of ways you can, you can do this, but I found this one to be like the most foolproof way. Um, 
So there's something about this split second after someone has opened their eyes where the pupils are like hunting for, in this case, you, because you're going to tell them to look, to open their eyes and look at you. They're like hunting and they're, there's something, there's some energy behind the eyes in that moment. They like are like almost more alive. Um, it's kind of hard to explain. Um, but I find that that moment looks really nice in photographs. Um, and so this technique is something you can do at any point during a shoot. Um, even if they're mid action, like even if they're like already doing something with their body that you've asked them to do, um, you can always step in and do this trick. And so so yeah. you can and i'm sorry i'm interrupting no um, you can essentially take those prompt the prompts you shared and pair that with, with the s and and is that how these two models gave you totally different eyes yeah mm, okay mm -hmm. so okay. yeah you could have already given them a prompt of like you know you're in this place doing this thing and they're actively doing that and then you can in the middle of that action, whip this one out. Um, so I'm gonna give two examples, a way to do this if, if the shoot is kind of slow paced and you have time to explain yourself. Um, so what I might do if I do this every shoot, I do this, I do this shot every single time I, I photograph someone. Um, so what I might say is, okay, you keep doing what you're doing. My camera's down, my camera's down here. You keep doing what you're doing. I'm actually going to have you close your eyes for this one. They'll close their eyes. And I say, and on three, I want you to open them. Okay. They say, okay. One, two, three. That's it. Done. If the shoot is moving really fast, you know, things are happening. You're able to like give prompts, give directions. They're taking it. They're taking it on. They feel good. Then the fast version is, okay, close your eyes and open right at me. Done. So the trick is just that they close their eyes right before because the pupils get big and then them hunting for you makes them like very energetic. Um, so this is like a foolproof way to get really nice kind of energized eye contact. This is something I had, uh, I really wished I learned much earlier in my career. Um, it's only become clear to me in the more recent years. Um, that how you direct your dance partner on set is not your only tool to evoking emotion. Um, things like color and styling and makeup and all those things are really huge in the storytelling process and honestly deserve just as much attention. Um, and so this is where, you know, preparing for a shoot beforehand comes into play. Uh, don't underestimate what brainstorming and collaboration ahead of time can do for you on the day of. Um, so these images you're seeing here, this is actually my uh, barista at my local coffee shop. Um, and she's incredible at doing her makeup. She's always got fun hair. She's always ha She always has amazing outfits. Um, she is by no means a model, but I approached her and was like, I, I'm a photographer and I absolutely would love and be honored to photograph you one day. And so one day we finally got in the studio um, and just because of Jade's personality and how colorful she always is, I wanted, I wanted the whole shoot to match that, you know, so choosing background colors, choosing her outfits, choosing all of this was very intentional. Of course, uh, on that same note, um, the work you do in post-production really kind of seals the deal um, and sets in the final feeling you want your imagery to give off. Um, and so this is just the image on the left uh, is how I shot it. Um, and then these four edits on the right are just using various Visco presets. And this is just to show you that the choices you're making in editing really matter. Um, and it will heavily affect the overall mood or emotion uh, of your imagery. And while we're talking about editing, um, this is a quick little editing session that I did on that photograph from the last slide. Um, I wanted to show you a real-time editing session just on my phone. Um, I'm using some of my favorite presets here. 
This is Fuji Velvia 50. Um, and I'm just playing with like character, warmth, strength, just I like to kind of take the slides in every direction to see what exactly it's doing. Um, that'll also show you how much is too much. Um, so here I'm just kind of testing out my, my favorite presets, seeing which one works best. Um, this one is Kodak Color Plus 200. I really love this one. I use this one a lot. I'm not going to lie. Um, the next one is Kodak Ektar 100. I also use this one a lot. And that's funny because I actually don't love shooting Ektar. Like actual rolls of Ektar are not my favorite, but I am all about this filter in Visco. There's something about it. <laughs> um, and then of course, like probably a lot of people, I love all the portraits. Um, I chose 800 for this one. Um, it's a pretty bright image, so maybe not the most popular choice, but it ended up looking quite gorgeous. So I chose 800 for this one. Um, and I'm just kind of seeing at the bottom, like what I want to go in and, and mess with, um, because that window light was so bright, I'm bringing down the highlights quite a bit to keep that all intact. Um, and then I think I go over to my exposure. Oh no, I'm straightening. Yes. And then I'm also using the skew tool to make sure that that couch is straight. Cause I was not straight on to that couch. Um, and luckily the line of the couch allows me to see if my image is off just a bit. So I fixed that. Um, and then I'm going to drop my exposure a bit. I like my stuff moody. I can't lie. Um, so dropping that exposure and then always adding in some grain. Uh, I'm guilty of this, maybe I to a fault. <laughs> I, it's really, really, really good touch on this. Stuff. It is. <laughs> it is. Okay. And now you're going to see me sort of experiment with the blur tool. I, this is like my favorite tool on any mobile app ever. I wish this was, I wish there was a version of this on desktop that I could use. Um, because what you can do in Lightroom is just not this powerful. So you can see here, I'm kind of playing. I'm like, okay, linear might not be right because um, it's just sort of making the sides weird. So maybe the circular option's better. Um, and just making sure it's not like too drastic to the point that it just looks like over the top. So um, there you have it. That was the final I ended up with. Um, so that is sort of my rundown um, of how to get powerful portraits uh, in many different ways. Um, I hope there was some nuggets in there that helped some of you. Um, I'll leave up this screen for a second. If you're interested to go find me on the internet, these are the places you can. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm interested to see the questions you all have. Um, I feel like I could go on and on and on about this for like two more hours. Um, so hopefully I didn't leave you hanging too much. And hopefully there was something there you could grasp onto. <laughs> and then I do want to mention um, Visco has been running a challenge um, sort of in uh, kind of paired with this presentation today. Um, and you all have been submitting and I have been like blown away by the submissions. These are some of them on the screen right now. Um, I just had to call these out. Um, and for those of you who have not submitted or haven't even heard about the challenge, um, hopefully something today inspired you to want to go take some new portraits. Um, and lucky enough for you, the challenge is actually still open. Um, so you will be able to submit to that if you want. Um, and I will be looking forward to seeing what you all create. But I think that's all the time we have for today. I know some people are like around the world right now and it's 20 a.m. So we amazing. Really yes. Thank you so much, Taylor. I just want to give you a moment to say whatever you want to say. Say bye to everyone before I give some announcements. We'll hop off. But thank yeah. you. Yeah. So no, thank you. This was so amazing. I honestly wish we had two more hours. Um, <laughs> it was great to answer your guys' questions. Honestly, I am not opposed to any of you who asked a question and didn't get theirs answered. Like just write me on Instagram or something. Um, I'm absolutely happy to, uh, help you beyond 
right now um, in this presentation. Um, yeah, come find me on the internet and uh, we can chat. And I'm really excited to see uh, some challenge submissions roll in. So get on that. <laughs>